I may have just found my absolute favorite card from War of the Spark. This thing is fantastic. <music> Greetings, owners of fine luxury cardboard rectangles. We are here today to talk about a very, very interesting card from War of the Spark, something that both excites me on an art level and flavor level, and at the same time is very interesting mechanically. It, it reminds me of a number of old cards from back in the day at different points in Magic the Gathering's history. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna break this discussion up into two chunks. What we're gonna talk about first is the card's mechanics, how it works, and the cards that it's reminiscent of, and then afterwards, we'll get into the gushing about the artwork, because honestly, the artwork is just through, through the roof on this one. It's absolutely incredible. So the card we're dealing with today, if you don't already know, is Deliver Unto Evil. Man, this card really, really stands out from the other cards. Let's take a look at what you get here. One black, two colors, and I gotta say, honestly, thinking about yesterday's video and discussing the Elder Spell, Black is getting some really potent cards in this set. So one black, two colorless, choose up to four cards in your graveyard, four target cards, obviously. If you control a Bolus Planeswalker, return those cards to your hand. Otherwise, an opponent gets to pick two of those cards and those chosen cards, you leave those in your graveyard and put the rest into your hand. And then you exile, deliver unto evil. So on the surface of it, it's very, very simple. You're gonna get to pick Four cards in your graveyard that you want to get back and I like the fact that it's up to four so you can use it if you have three cards in your graveyard and just are okay with getting one back if you don't have a bolus so you choose four cards if you happen to have a bolus on the board which isn't the easiest situation to be in considering how they, they're they cost the most boluses cost at least five mana to cast so having a bolus on the table is not going to be super easy I'm guessing most of the time this spell is going to be cast with just the the your opponent getting to pick so you'll pick four cards and then under most circumstances your opponent will pick two of those and you won't get those two but you'll you'll basically what will happen is pick four cards the two least desirable of those four cards go back to your hand and this is a departure from a lot of black spells which normally only let you return creatures from the graveyard black has a ton of cards that return creatures from the graveyard either to play or to your hand but not very many that allow you to bring them back actually full on to your hand of any card type, basically. So green that's green's provenance. If you look at green, it was traditionally a green ability. It started all the way back in the beginning with regrowth. Regrowth would be your spell to bring back any card from your graveyard. And you compare regrowth to raise dead or animate dead, which are both black cards that affect cards in the graveyard, but specifically only creatures. So this reaches outside of black's normal provenance just a, just a little bit just just a, t a, t a tiny bit but uh the flavor of it is fantastic it feels there's two cards that this card kind of comes together to feel like for me and this is granted from the perspective of somebody who's been playing the game for a long time so you may think of other cards but for me there's two specific cards that combine to create this card one of them is probably going to be more obvious to people than the other. So I'll start with the one that I think might feel less obvious. And bear in mind, I'm not saying these cards are equal power, because the card I'm about to mention is more powerful than Deliver Unto Evil. But there does there is some kind of overlap. I mean, they have the first of all, they have the same casting cost, a black and two colors. We're talking about Yogmoth's Will, for anybody who hadn't already guessed it. And that's from all the way back in the Urza block. So that's like near the end of the 90s, guys. We're talking old, like 20-year-old card, pretty much. So Yagmas Will is until the end of the turn, you may play cards in your graveyard as though they were in your hand. Cards put into your graveyard this turn are removed from the game instead. So Yagmas Will actually exiles itself. It doesn't say that on the card, but just the effect of it, once it resolves, it'll go to the graveyard. So it gets exiled. So that part of the deliver unto evil because that's the last thing it says on the card of deliver unto evil is exile it that part obviously carries over in yagmas mill yagmas will let you cast a bunch of stuff from your graveyard so you're going to have to pay the casting costs on them anyways so there's not that much difference if there were four cards in your graveyard and you had out uh, a nickel bolus and cast the um deliver unto evil to bring the cards back to your hand or you cast yagmas will it would be very similar because you're still gonna have to pay all the casting costs. So putting them back into your hand lets you pay all the casting costs the same way as if you were just casting them from your graveyard. Now, actually in this ideal scenario that I've laid out, technically 
the the new card, Deliver Unto Evil, is better than Yog Moss Will because you're going to get to keep the cards and put them back in your hand, which means you don't have to use them right away. Yog Moss Will is do it this turn and exile the cards. So with Deliver Unto Evil, you get to keep the cards in your hand. It's not just a one turn thing because you get to keep the cards. So you can just go, oh, hey, I'll have them later on. And the cards don't end up getting exiled from the game as well. But with Yog Moss Will, you can do all kinds of craziness feed your graveyard with a ton of cards and go like buck nutty. So I'm definitely not saying they're the same in power level. I'm just saying that I felt some really strong similarities and that with a fewer amount of cards in your graveyard, Yogmoth's Will and Deliver Unto Evil function very, very similarly. Because it's just really a difference of cast it from your graveyard or put it in your hand and then cast it. Same, same difference if you're doing it all in one turn. So they're both better in different situations. Overall power-wise, I'd say Yogmoth's Will is the stronger card, but Deliver Unto Evil has some real potential, obviously held back by the fact that your opponent is the one who gets to decide. But there are ways to work around that, and we'll discuss that when we talk about the other half of the two cards that combine to make this for me here. Now, Yagmas Will, I don't have that much to say about the artwork because in all honesty, it's just like a giant slug monster for Xing, kind of like tearing through the trash or something. I, I'm not 100% what's going on in this artwork in all honesty. Whereas the next card we're going to talk about is a little more straightforward. So the other card, and this is probably one that more people thought of because, I mean, it's newer and obviously there are some really obvious parallels there in terms of caring about four cards and your opponent getting to make the choice. And that card, of course, is Gifts Ungiven. One blue, three colorless. It's an instant. Search your library for up to four cards with different names and reveal them. Target opponent chooses two of those cards, put the chosen cards into your graveyard and the rest into your hand, then shuffle your library. So basically, it's a very similar concept where you have, okay, you're going to get to choose four cards, your opponent's going to get to pick the best ones and make you not have, not end up with them. So just like Deliver Unto Evil, your opponent gets to choose what stays in your graveyard. With Gifts Ungiven, your opponent gets to choose two of the cards and go, boom, send them to your graveyard. Plus, unlike Gifts Ungiven, you don't have a restriction. With Deliver Unto Evil, there's no restriction. Just pick four cards. Doesn't matter about names. Doesn't matter about any of that. There are no restrictions. Pick any four cards you want. Gifts Ungiven is a little more restricted. Granted, that's because if they didn't do that, then you could just go and get four copies of the same card and guarantee yourself two copies of it. So I understand why Gift Ungiven is restricted in the way it is. Now, I said earlier, a lot, like a minute or two before, about how it's not necessarily a, li a limitation that's that big a deal when your opponent gets to pick what you don't get. And the reason I'm saying that is with Gifts Ungiven, what people ended up doing was they would go and get two cards that they really wanted, and then they would go and get two cards that would let them get things back from their graveyard. Basically, the idea was, I'm going to get the cards I really want, and I'm going to get the things that will get the cards I want back in case you put them in the graveyard. So it's like, oh, I'll grab an Eternal Witness. When Eternal Witness comes out, you return a card from your graveyard. So the whole thing was, pick two of these. It really doesn't matter in the end what you pick because I'm going to get what I want. So people found ways around those restrictions. Now, Gifts Ungiven, I really I really enjoy the artwork. I like the, the blues and the purples. You've got this Sora Tommy just sitting there with her ears kind of laid back, just idly like fingering these, these penguin statues, these tiny little, what look like penguins to me. And I like that they represent the four gifts, the, the Gifts Ungiven, the four of them are sitting there as there's four cards that are being searched up. I like it when it's visually represented, the number of like items you're dealing with, if it's card drawing or whatever, it's cool to have that. So these four represent the as of yet Gifts Ungiven. And I like the name of Gifts Ungiven because half of the cards go to the graveyard and those are gifts that you'll never get. I mean, obviously people found a workaround, but flavor wise, Gifts Ungiven is a really cool card, honestly. And it's very different and it's combo-licious. So Deliver Unto Evil, has a similar kind of feel. Obviously, it does have a restriction compared to Gifts Ungiven, whereas Gifts Ungiven can go through your deck. Deliver Unto Evil requires that the cards have already made it to your graveyard. So that does that does make a difference, right? You do have to be aware of that. Now, when we actually move on to talk about the artwork for this, oh my, oh my God. Seb McKinnon is incredibly talented. In all honesty, he's an artist that's so good that it makes me wonder how much longer he's going to settle for how much Wizards of the Coast is paying him to do artwork. Because his work 
is absolutely breathtaking. When we take a look at the Deliver Unto Evil, and we're not just gonna look at the, the version from the cart, because there's actually a wider version with a little bit more artwork to it. And granted, it's it's the least important aspect of it, but seeing in its full scale, is just, it's so impressive to me. I love this artwork so much. This looks like the cover to a storybook. It feels like a, like a storybook for kids, but the kind that's gonna be really interesting and not pander to them so much. The kind of kid book that you would find like decades ago before they write this, like the stuff they make now is, I don't know, there's it's some, some of them are a little so dark where you're like, are, are you sure this is a story for kids kind of thing? Where it skirts that line. And it doesn't just, it doesn't baby the children. It gives them a little dose of reality and how dark things can be. It's, this artwork is absolutely, absolutely breathtaking. It's so amazing the way that it's done. You've got this big black hole in the back with this vortex of what looks like planeswalker sparks as well as it almost feels like the nighttime sky is being sucked in. Like everything, all of existence is being pulled into this swirling vortex. And you have Bolas, so gigantic and magnificent, just leaned over, just staring down at the Gatewatch, the four members of the Gatewatch who are here, right? Because this is not, this doesn't show Liliana. And they're all showed, they're all shown with their heads like bowed and defeated. There's just this feeling of like they all they've all got their they've got their hands on each other's shoulders. Like they're just they're on display like I, I, there's just something that's just so so defeated about their look. It's absolutely incredible. And you've got Bolus lording there over the city and you can see the city is all on Bolus's side, which and Ravnik is pretty much all city. So it makes it look it makes it look like he has just dominated the entirety of Ravnica and you have the Gatewatch out kind of in this desolation. I'm not sure exactly what the things in front are supposed to be. I don't know if those are, are branches with like, like little dots of light running across them, but whatever it is, this artwork has like such a, such a bleak feel to it when you look at the Gatewatch and see them defeated. And I don't know, just like the, the bowed posture, you can see like not only that over the heads down, but their shoulders, like, look at Chandra. It's like a shoulder slumped sort of like, it's like children being brought to brought to their teacher or something. And they're like, oh, we're gonna get in trouble. And it totally diminishes their stature. It makes it feel like these, these planeswalkers are nowhere near the level of Bolas. It makes it feel like Bolas is the adult, the Gatewatch are mere children who are foolish to even try and defy him. And Bolas's head is framed right in the center of that vortex showing him as like the 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 whole the whole focus the the focus the locus whatever you want to call it he is he is the main thing basically it's just it's absolutely incredible the city of Ravnik itself looks absolutely gorgeous it almost it almost has like a, a Susian kind of feel in I don't know Bolas's face he almost feels like he has like a, a Grinch style like smile there but he also just looks, he looks ancient and wise and powerful. And it's funny because he also has his head bent down, but they, they have the, the Gatewatch has their head bent down in subjugation and Bolas has his head bent over in inspection. But I told, it totally gives me that feeling of some like stern teacher or adult looking down at little like school children and just, just judging them. And the kids are like, oh, we're sorry we broke the window, Bolas. That kind of thing. It's just, I, I, I would not, I would not want to be another artist who does magic art right now and have to compare my work to Seb McKinnon because the man is just a beast. This artwork screams to me of old world magic the gathering. This is the kind of stuff I'm talking about. I've talked before about how I'm, I'm not as big a fan of the art direction in current days, but this is amazing. Seb McKinnon is responsible for so much incredible incredible artwork and we are genuinely lucky to have such a talented person and i mean there are, there are a fair number of talented magic artists but he stands out it's like in the anime shows when they have one of those those little kid prodigies who's just better than all the adults around him and the adults are like whoa but they're also like kind of like oh man i wish it was like that it's that level here with this artwork this is incredible i mean i i don't know any of the proper terms to describe artwork so i'm sure anybody who actually does know laughs at the way that i get all excited and describe it but to me it's just so it's so incredible it just feels like bolus is is dominating all and devouring all with a magical vortex this artwork is i want i want more i want more of this so let me know what you guys think we're going to go ahead and roll the golden scroll 
those are the people who have my back on Patreon or through channel memberships. Thanks very much for supporting what I do. Special shout out to Captain Pickle, Captain Jack Pickle for raising his Patreon pledge. Always happy to have that support. Thank you very much. And to all of you, I say, I will see you guys tomorrow. Thanks for being here.